So wait, Dark Universe... I ain't editing that out. Welcome, everybody, to a brand new episode here of The Geek Buddies! <gasps> hey! What's up, everybody? We're back here with a special weekend edition of The Geek Buddies because of our schedules. This was the time we could record it, so... Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun talking about everything that went down in the world of geekdom and a lot we got going on today. We're going to talk about some new trailers this week. We're talk about some stories that drop some entertainment stories and get in some dark universe stuff. We're going to talk a little bit of Star Wars acolyte stuff that's going on. And our main topic is going to be breaking down episode four or season four, episode four of The Boys, which in my opinion was one of the darkest and possibly best episodes of the series ever. So we're going to have a fun discussion here today about all of those topics. Just want to uh, first introduce ourselves. I am the outlaw, John Roca, writer, producer, and host here on the Geek Buddies. I am Michael Vogel, writer and producer of animated TV shows and movies. And this is Shannon McClung. I'm a television actor and an animation writer where you can see some of our current work. All three seasons of Strawberry Shortcake, Barry in the Big City on YouTube. The first two seasons on Netflix, all four seasonal specials on Netflix as Ooh. well. Nice, nice. A lot of stuff dropped on Netflix this week, too. So definitely y'all should go check out that uh, Strawberry Shortcake stuff for sure. All right. So we got a lot to get into the way the show works. Each of us brings up a geek news item. We talk about it amongst ourselves, take a couple of breaks, then get into our massive geek news item, which is our spoiler review of episode four, season four of The Boys. So, uh, Michael, I think you take it away first. What do we got? We got theme park fun to kick things off uh universal studios has been doing a pretty cool thing as they have been hyping up their newest and third theme park in the orlando area epic universe uh they released a big video that kind of covered what the entire scope of the thing was going to be a few weeks ago and then each kind of subsequent every couple of weeks they've been deep diving into the different lands and this week we got a look at dark universe yeah uh not the shitty f interconnected film franchise franchise that Universal was planning, but the Universal monster themed section of the Epic Universe Park. And uh, as I said on Twitter, even though I love How to Train Your Dragon, I'm, yeah. I am I love Super Mario, I love all these things, this Dark Universe stuff really, I think, looks the coolest out of everything that we have seen so far. Okay. Uh, you know, like, uh, uh, it starts off, uh, Johnny just showed the picture a second ago. Yeah. Uh, with guests going through a giant portal with electrical currents flowing through it as they enter the Dark Universe section of the park and they enter the town of Darkmoor, a town that has been ravaged by all of the different monsters uh, and that you will be able to meet all of the monsters from the Universal Monster Universe there. Uh, they have a Monsters Unchained Frankenstein Experiment ride, which is the premier attraction, mm. a Curse of the Werewolf roller coaster, a Darkmoor ma monster makeup experience where you can turn yourself into into a monster and of close up of course up close meet and greets with the monster uh and they also have uh a um a dining area where you can meet monster hunters it looks very interactive it looks super creepy um it looks cool i mean universal is really going all out i mean the the theme park wars of orlando are heating up as orlando as, yeah. as universal is hyping the shit out of epic universe uh, Disney is talking about new attractions, adding a fifth gate there, adding a third gate in, or in Anaheim. Um, the, the theme park wars are getting fierce, guys. But what did you think <laughs> of our first look at uh, Dark Universe, and particularly Shannon, as somebody who is very well acquainted with Universal? What did you think of it? And do you think that the concept art, uh, do you think what's going to actually happen is going to live up to the art and the look that we've seen so far? So the the concept art, concept videos um, are always very, very exciting. You see what the artist, what they want to do, what they're able to accomplish. Concept, concept art and concept videos always make the lands look a little bigger than they actually are. Even though I do think Dark Universe in terms of acreage, I do think it is going to be the largest park of the three. I might be wrong on that. But looking at what Universal, the advantage that Universal has over Disney is the... Oh, 
is the ability to push into that PG-13 area, which in the video, one of their one of their execs does acknowledge that, that we can keep this family friendly, but we can go into maybe a little bit of darker territory. Um, basically breaking it up into three sections that you have the mystic section. That's where the curse of the werewolf is going to be. Um, looking at the design that it is a uh, revolving roller coaster, it looks similar in terms of just the ride vehicle at, to Guardians of the Galaxy in uh, Epcot, which almost killed me. So <laughs> they, they do they do call it a family friendly coaster. So maybe maybe my uh, my my delicate belly won't be uh, won't be as affected. Um, but who knows? We'll see. Uh, the other area, the sort of Dracula area, that's where they have their kind of big sit down restaurant called Das Steakhouse that is run by the uh, familiars of vampires. And that as a concept, I think is really, really fun. Yeah, I like that idea. The Burning Blade Tavern, like, you know, they talk about the uh, the wind, the the windmill that's on fire. That's very you know popular from the Frankenstein films. But that's where your that's where your your bar is going to be. That's where, uh, you know, these uh, monster hunters called the hounds. That's where they're going to hang out. And then you have the Frankenstein area that it's it's I think it's called Frankenstein Manor. Um, yeah. This deals with the great, great granddaughter of Henry Frankenstein named Victoria Frankenstein. So if you read Mary, Mary Shelley's book, the character is Victor Frankenstein. I think they don't they didn't want Victoria to be the great, great granddaughter of Victor. So they changed it to Henry. Um, but I think making that change, because it's basically going further in times in terms of the story mm -hmm. um, that she has basically captured all of our classic universal monsters. And she's trying to do a thing. Um so it's really exciting. What's what Universal in the past, there's been a little bit of challenge is when they have some sort of corporate IP oversight. When you look at Harry Potter, when you look at uh, uh, Nintendo, when you, when you have someone who could come in and put the kibosh on the whole thing, it's something that they license. Um, Universal does a really good job when Universal is in charge of it it can be hit or miss. Mm -hmm. And as the Universal Monsters are their IP, that's kind of the, I'll, I'll be curious what the long run looks like for it. Um, but in terms of a land, again, it's it's something that I feel like we haven't really gotten yet in terms of family theme parks is stepping into that, into that darker world of like these classic monsters. I mean, I think it's really, really exciting. Um, I, I hope that the three of us get to go next year when it opens on a little geek buddies a little geek buddies media trip I mean, um but yeah i mean it, the yeah. the the concept is really really exciting I, I i'm very curious what it'll look like in person also in the uh <laughs> orlando humidity <laughs> uh i think we both know someone who can maybe help us, who's involved with the creation of this, who can maybe help us go as press. We will see. I will actually reach out to that person and see what they say. Yeah, I, look, I, obviously I don't have the expertise. I only worked in the park less than two years, so I don't have the expertise Shannon does of years and years of seeing these lands pop up and seeing these lands go and seeing the ideas work under certain auspices and not work under certain auspices. But my reaction to this is this was a fun six-minute trailer, and this got me excited to go and see this. And also, you know, as I get older, I'm like, it's amazing how much stuff endures. And it's amazing that Dracula and Wolfman and Frankenstein have not gone the way of dated old monsters and uh, this kind of boring. The fact that there is still new life to be pumped into these old monsters that are almost a century old in terms of their creation uh, on screen, not obviously their creation liter in literature terms, I think is fantastic. And so this idea of a new character like Victoria Frankenstein and she's got this plot and she's trying to put all these things together, it's a way to keep you kind of invested in the story as you're going from place to place. So for kids, it works. For adults, you've got places you can go and hang out. And look, the roller coaster is a spinning roller coaster. So that tells me they're trying to appeal to the younger demographic as or uh, and the older demographic who can handle it who maybe don't have sensitive stomachs. So I think it's a great thing to do that. The steakhouse situation, that's a genius idea. But address, but getting your face done, I think that's a real smart interactive way as well. And having recently been with you guys uh, at Disneyland, I, I understand the approach here of what they're doing. They're trying to make it feel like that, a completely immersive experience where everything is available to you so that you never have to mentally leave the land if you don't want to until you actually physically leave the land. So to me, overall, I thought this came off really well, although I don't know who the hell Henry Frankenstein is. I still go, okay, fine, Victoria. That's like, fine. 
Yeah, maybe they didn't want to go Victor Victoria with all that implies, but I understand where that was. So yeah, um, I'm in. I'm in, Mikey. It's funny you, you it's funny that you use the word immersive because one of the things that I think is interesting, and this was very prevalent in this trailer in particular, as opposed to the others, is yeah. Uh, if you watch Jenny Nicholson's four hour video about Galactic Star Cruiser that uh, that has been making oh, the rounds, where right. she like went and had her whole experience and really breaks down the rise and fall of Galactic Star Cruiser, she talks a good bit about how all theme park, like immersive is the buzzword. Immersive is what every theme park is going for. They're going yeah. for that immersive experience. They want you to dive in, they want you to live the world. And when you look at what Disney announced Galaxy's Edge was gonna be early on, there was, you're gonna walk in, you're gonna see aliens walking around, you're gonna interact with them, you get to choose your, do you wanna be a smuggler? Do you wanna be this? Do you wanna be that? And then when you actually got to Galaxy's Edge, it was pulled back a lot. And a lot of that immersion went to Galactic Star Cruiser because they realized that to actually do that, it was pretty expensive. Mm. And so I do think a lot of what we see in this dark universe, to Shannon's point, this is what the goal is. And yeah, you go in, you go into the restaurant and it's the familiars and they're really working for the <laughs> vampires and you go into the bar and you get to meet the monster hunters and there's monsters going around and it's the whole thing like, sure, how much of that is going to happen and how much of that is you're going to have a waiter at the steakhouse that's just really tired and really bored in the humidity and they've been dealing with people all day and they're like, yes, I am a familiar. What would you like with your steak on a steak? Um, so it'll be interesting to see how much they actually pull off the immersion because I think that's ultimately the goal. But I agree that as a trailer, this definitely got me excited. It's, it's, it's almost like June Garofalo in The Cable Guy where he's like, do you have utensils? They didn't have utensils. Oh, but they had Pepsi. Dude. Yeah, it's kind of like that kind of a situation. <laughs> it's like it's like even when you go to Galaxy's Edge, it depends on like the person you get. You you'll walk through Galaxy's Edge, you can go up to somebody and you can be like, and you can be like, you don't want to charge me for this merchandise, <laughs> and they'll be like, okay, like I haven't heard that five times today. Can you please just give me your credit card, sir? And then some people are down to clown. So it's just you. Know, it always depends. <laughs> we've we've done. I mean, and you've experienced obviously Michael Halloween Horror Nights. That's a very that's about as immersive as it gets for that kind of thing like those characters roaming around they are absolutely messing with you do you think they'll take elements of that for something like this so that the audience so that the people who go are immersive are immersed in the world or do you think that's a little too far in how they approach it with halloween horror nights because they will they, they, will, they will take elements of it but they are mm. going to scale it back just because okay. um you know what you what you sign up for with halloween horror nights is and i think it's even on the website when you buy the ticket like this is a pg 14 pg 15 pg 16 event right, right um so what they don't want is people bringing their kids in in strollers oh, and being perfect. terrified because the wolf man jumped out from the corner and tried to get them now if you go <laughs> on a ride that's kind of on you like i have no doubt based off of the little bit of animation that we saw from the Monsters Unchained uh, section, the, the ride, the dark mm. ride, that there are going to be crying children. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I have no doubt. Even on the family-friendly rides at uh, Disney, like, yeah. you know, Snow White, oh. you see that witch, kids cry. Yeah, so, but, but amongst the park, I think you're probably going to see a cuddlier version mm. of Frankenstein's monster, of the bride. I mean, again, kids are going to... Some of them are going to get scared. I probably would have been one of them, but that is not going to be their objective when they go out there. Like there's not going to be any jump scares in the park, in the, in the common section of the park. That's my, that's my guess. So no vampires randomly attacking women and sucking their blood is what you're saying. That's not going to be there. I mean, not that, not that work for the park. No. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Michael, did you want to chime in with anything else, or are you good on this one? No, just uh, like Shannon said, hopefully we get to go check this out in person, and uh, Epic yeah. Universe is coming next year, and it is going to be a wild theme park uh, battle. That's for sure. I'll take a look at that. All right, let's take a break uh, real quick, and then we'll jump into some uh, trailers and some other more news stories right after this. Do, 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 do. That was for the story before. So today we got trailers, trailers, news. Oh! So for our first trailer, we got the second teaser at Max's The Penguin. Yeah. So this one, this is the spinoff of Matt Reeves' The Batman movie. This is the continuation of the journey of Oswald Cobblepot. Uh, portrayed by Colin Farrell. And this time we get a little bit more of the supporting cast. We get to see Chris Mil uh, Miliati. We get to see Clancy Brown. Um, this 
trailer, it just, the, the show I'm so legitimately excited for. I mean, this is not, this is not commonplace that you have a really successful movie and then they take a spinoff television show that literally takes place within that same world. The scope of this, like you see that Gotham is still flooded. Um, Cobblepot Oz is trying to figure out where his place is going to be. Like he wants to supplant or, or no, not supplant because Carmen Falcone's dead, uh, but he wants to take that over. But then you also have the children of Falcone that he has to deal with the elements of Salvatore Moroni, who's Clancy Brown, Clancy Brown is playing, but is in jail right now. This just looks, I mean, this was such a, this is such an exciting um, take uh, because again, coming out of the Batman movie, which I think most people did like a little long, long third act, but uh, coming out of that film, everyone loved Colin Farrell's Penguin. Um, he was just one of the standouts of that film and getting to see the continuation of this is really exciting, but I'll throw it over to you gentlemen first. Johnny, what did you Ooh. think of our second look at the Penguin? Yeah, I loved it. I mean, I did a reaction to it immediately. I, I loved it. I love this world. I love where we're going. This speaks my language. I like the um, different areas of Gotham that we're going into. I like that he's got this young kid who is his assistant, who's probably coming from a hard scrabble existence. And it's like, there's going to be things he's going to have to confront and deal with. Okay, he's helping me elevate my status in the world, but he's also doing this nefarious shit how much of that am i gonna have to come to terms with or have a, a internal conversations about what i'm okay with what i'm not okay with i love that being an element of this and finally christina Milioti getting absolutely uh, uh the showcase here in this particular trailer who i love as an actress since palm springs and other things and of course the memorable stint she had on on um on 30 rock uh which was great but seeing her come and be a part of this clearly this is going to be a battle between those two and both of them feel like overlooked people which makes it even more exciting, right? You can't, you're not actually choosing a side here because you've got Oswald who, is, who has been looked over and ridiculed and made fun of and not seen, even uh, Carmine says like, what, you're going to take over before he dies? He's got that kind of, mo so he, clearly he's got that drive and determination. Christina's saying clearly there, Sophia Falcone saying, I've been looked over by these old men, that's going to stop. So that's all exciting. So for me, the vibe, the energy, the acting, the back and forth we got here, the overall um, uh, approach to this is uh, got me even more excited to see through this trailer. Mikey, you ready to get some water wings and go back to Gotham? Uh, I am. I actually, uh, I've been lucky enough to see a little bit of the Penguin uh, and talk Ooh, to some people at nice. Warner Brothers about some of it as well. And I can say that from the little bit more that I've seen than what's in the trailer, um, it's going to be great. It's great. Oh. Uh, Colin Farrell's Penguin. Like, I think that what Colin Farrell did in the Batman, which everybody really enjoyed, doesn't even scratch the surface of the performance that we're going to get in this show. Awesome. Um, putting him center stage, you really get how Colin Farrell's inhabiting this character. Um, and it, it I, I just think we're in for a real treat. I don't know if we're ever getting a sequel to the Batman. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what given given the direction that James Gunn and Peter Safran's DC universe is going to take. I don't know where more tales of this version of the Batman go. Um, but if all we get is the Batman and then get this Penguin series, it'll still be a treat. So uh, yeah, I, I'm really excited. I think again, given the little bit that I've seen, I think the trailer, the tone, the, the feel of the trailer. You know, sometimes you see a trailer and you're like, is this going to be what we get? This is what we're going to get, and it's going to be fucking great. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh totally agree. I mean the the uh likelihood the more that Batman sequel gets delayed, the more it seems less likely that we're going to see it. What? Um you but guys it really think this? Yeah. Really? I mean kind of. James Bond came out last week and said the script is done for Batman 2. Sure. For more than years. That's sure. great. <laughs> wow. You guys think he's going to he's going to put the kibosh on this thing. I think it, when they are looking at their at their broader plans, does it necessarily behoove them to do it? I think that would be a massive mistake. But. Here's 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 really the question. Okay. And I mean, this is really what it boils down to: is you're as you're sitting in James, we're in the in the seat that James Gunn and Peter Safran are sitting in. You have a Batman, uh, a sequel to the Batman, very successful, oh. great cast. You got the Penguin coming out on Max. You people are anticipating this next movie. Um, and you want to put a lot of power behind that if you're going to do it and say, get people really excited about that. Yeah. You also have a story where Batman's a dad and mm -hmm. you're introducing Damian Wayne. And that's part of the bigger universe that you are 
building out for DC and Warner Brothers. And at a certain point, the closer that these two movies get to each other, the closer you get to the problem of having to get audiences at, to get excited and promote two different Batmans at the same time or within the same window. It's not. And the closer those two things get to each other, the more you're like, you got to choose a Batman. Really? You can't you can't go, <laughs> hey, we really want you to get super excited about Robert uh, about uh, Robert Pattinson in November, but then in July, get excited about this guy. Like audiences are gonna be like, what the fuck are you doing? Like audiences are so exhausted with the multiverse, exhausted with multiple versions of things. It's like when DC was kind of doing their, we're not doing a multiverse, we're doing our own thing. So the Batman is over here and the Joker is here and this is here, that's fine. But when they are getting ready to launch a big universe and you have these outliers, Joker 2 is kind of fine because it's getting in there right under the gun. Like it's coming out mm. end of this year. Literally and, under the gun. <laughs> and then and then and then Superman comes after. But once once Superman comes out and that DC universe really kicks off, it just I'm not saying it's not gonna happen, but the closer it gets to Brave and the Bold, the more I'm like, all right, well, what are you gonna choose? Yeah, if Brave and the Bold were maybe going to be there. If that were going to be the capper to their first phase, their first chapter, I think there is a possibility. And if that Matt Reeves sequel had happened earlier, but I do agree with Vogel. When you're having to promote two Batman at the same time, it becomes potentially you're you're diluting the character at that point. Like even though you know we've had Superman on the small screen, we've had Superman on the big screen. The I think the possibility of having two at the same time on the big screen in close succession it does kind of like, it's the law of diminishing returns. Like, where do we want to focus? <laughs> All right. I, I disagree. Look, I, I hope, I hope, we're, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, no. I, I, I just disagree. Cause I think if you make good stuff, people are going to come watch it. They don't, they don't give a shit. Oh, two jokers. Great. I don't care. Is it good? Great. Who's starring in it? Awesome. Is it getting good reviews? I'm going to go see it. I don't, I don't think people care as much as you guys think they care. I, I think they just want to see good stuff and they're willing to suspend their disbelief. Cause I don't think a lot of people are sitting like Charlie day at the house with a billboard going like, Wait, where, who's connected to what? And who's going to, they don't care. They're like, is it good? Great. I'm going to go see it. You know? And so I don't think this is, I get I, your points that you're saying is if you're constructing a universe, you don't want to confuse. I get where you're coming from. I actually don't, but I don't think a majority of the people actually give a shit about that. They just want to have fun in the movies. I think this summer is showing us that people do want to have fun at the movies, but they're mm -hmm. going to be way more uh, choiceful about where they choose to have their fun. Like, they're not going, oh, there's two Batman movies. They both look good. I'm going to go see both. People are literally like, I don't really, I'll go see Inside Out 2. And mm -hmm. I'll go see this, but I'm not going to see these four other movies in theaters at all. I'll just wait to watch those on streaming. Um, you know, mm -hmm. like, I already had somebody tell me the other day, they don't really care to go to the movie theater to see a movie until Wicked comes out. Like, people are just like, yeah, look at, I'm going to wow. see Deadpool and Wolverine. I'm going to see Wicked. That's, that's where I'm going to go to the movies mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. So I think when we're living in this era of people clearly making uh, more decisions about when they go to the movies, two Batmans within a year or two years of each other does potentially uh, would make me concerned if I was in their position. Yeah, I know, and I get the point, but I also think you kind of make the point a little bit, Michael, on the other side in that, look, people know what the Batman is. That's a quantity they know. Like they know that with Inside Out, they know that with Deadpool, so they're going to go spend their money in that way. And maybe with Wicked because they love the play or the, the musical rather. So with the Batman too, that's a that's that's ready made. That's built. An audience is going to be there for that. Brave and the Bold, I don't know if they're going to be there for that. And if it's a if it's an actor who's not that well known like Corn Sweat, how many are going to really show up if they don't? So I don't know. Question. So if you were in their seat, yeah, and you really were worried about this, you would say, I think we should move forward with the sequel to the Batman, and we shouldn't put Batman or Damian Wayne in our DC universe. Yeah, I agree. I would not do Brave and Bold. Honestly, okay. I, I would kill Brave and Bold right now. I would let Batman run its course, not mess with Batman in my overall universe just yet, or throw him in in a different way to be part of a Justice League kind of approach. But no, I would. I, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of Brave and Bold, so I wouldn't have wanted to see this. You're throwing him in as a dad already, I think is... I don't know. I think it's a dangerous thing to, to to walk that path. I would have rather chosen the Pattinson, but I understand some people may not see it that way, and I totally respect that. So, you know, just my different point of view on it. Right. But yeah, well, we'll see what happens to you. Back to the penguin. <laughs> <laughs> it comes out this way. So I wanted to hear what you guys thought. So that's it. Yeah. it comes out this September on Max as an eight episode series. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to our next trailer and one that John and I won't have too much to add. But True. it was the first teaser for the second season of Star Trek 
Prodigy. So the really unique thing about this series is that the first season premiered on Paramount Plus. Um, it, and, and from what I understand, that the it, it had a really good fan base and that the fan base did really like it. And then came news about a year ago that Paramount Plus was not going to be showing the second season. It sounds like you know what had happened with a lot of animated series is you know you get you get two seasons right off the bat, and yeah. typically that that usually is the shelf life for an animated series. You get two seasons, that's it. Um, so ostensibly the the second series or the second season they you know that that train had left the station like they were working on it um it was pro it was more than likely was already written they were probably animating it and yeah. then uh netflix came out and saved it along with the help of the fan base so this is now the you know netflix is going to be showing the uh, first season i don't know if it's on there yet but then the second season mm -hmm. will be coming out next year in 2025 so mikey i'll throw it over to you as you're the one who's watched the show what did you think of that teaser for the second season of Star Trek Prodigy? Let's it, give I got really minute. excited for a couple of reasons. One, uh, <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. That <laughs> was... <laughs> uh, so the first thing is um, if you have not checked out Star Trek Prodigy and you are a Star Trek fan, you're probably not alone. I think a lot of people overlooked Star Trek Prodigy when it came out. Um, you know, it didn't get the promotion of some of the bigger live action Star Trek shows. It doesn't have that sort of adult appeal that Lower Decks does. It was designed to be a Star Trek show for younger kids. There was a lot of alien characters. It didn't quite look like what you thought of as Star Trek. Um, but if you haven't checked it out when it was on Paramount Plus, it is up on Netflix now, season one. And I highly recommend that you check it out because it's actually delightful. Uh, the first couple episodes that set up the whole concept of these alien creatures sort of unearthed Thing, this Federation starship and them finding it. They know nothing about the Federation. They find a hologram of uh, Captain Janeway who kind of leads them through what the Federation is. But it's actually a really cool show that takes a different tack on explaining what the Federation is and how people are inspired by the ideals of Starfleet. Um, and it's, it's a ton of fun, high level animation. And yeah, ultimately Paramount kind of felt like it wasn't doing what it needed to do for them. Um, and Netflix picked it up. And I think that if season two comes out and has uh, a strong showing, if Netflix shows that people really did check out season one, get excited about season two, A, it shows that Paramount Plus is the problem, not this show, um, <laughs> and, that, and that Netflix is just a monster and we should all be scared of them. But you should absolutely check it out, particularly if you're a fan of Star Trek Voyager. Uh, Janeway played a hologram in season one. If you watch the season two trailer, we have actual Admiral Janeway uh, in the show. Uh, part of the mystery of this starship in season one and how it ended up with these new alien races is tied to Chakotay from Voyager. And mm. we see a quick shot of him in this uh, look at season two. And Robert Picardo is also coming on and reprising his role as the emergency medical hologram from Voyager. So a lot of Voyager love in this show. Uh, looks really cool. Lots of new characters. All the characters coming back. It just looks like a blast. So I highly recommend that my two geek buddies check it out, even though Shannon avoids all things Star Trek like the plague. And I think everybody who hasn't checked out season one of Prodigy should absolutely go check it out on Netflix right now and gear up for season two because I think it's going to be a ton of fun. And I believe Netflix is releasing all 20 episodes, I think, of season two uh, at the same time. So it's going to be a big binge. Um. Why do they say timey wimey in the trailer? Because now I'm in my head. Because Doctor Who made Star Trek references. Now this is kind of a Doctor Who reference. So I mean, there's something going on behind is, the scenes. Timey wimey is absolutely a Doctor Who reference, but also <laughs> part of the reason that Chakotay needs to. Well, I'm trying to not spoil oh, too much okay, because okay, I okay. want people right. to check out season one. But I think right. I can say that. Part of the reason uh, that Chakotay needs to be rescued in season two and part of the reason um, and the drive of a lot of season one's how did this starship end up with these people, why are people going after this starship part of the storyline gets into some timey-wimey stuff uh, in its explanation and it looks like season two is going to be diving into some bigger timey-wimey stuff. Okay, fair point. So yeah, um, yeah, I think I I think I misspoke. Uh, so yeah, I guess Star Trek Prodigy season one is available now on Netflix, yeah. and season two will be debuting on July first. I think I got my <laughs> I read an article from a year ago, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's all cleared up. <laughs> you could probably knock that out in a day if they're twenty three minutes each, uh, twenty episodes. That should knock you out. In a, yeah, like twelve maybe to a couple days, but it's a solid weekend. I yeah. will say, like, you watch the first because I'll, I'll, this is what happened to me. I watched the first two episodes when it premiered, and mm -hmm. I went, "Wow, this animation is really good. I kind of like these characters. That was cute. 
I don't know if I'm gonna come back to it. And I kind of left it alone. Yeah. And it was later on when people uh, were talking about it, I kind of went back in and I tore through the rest of season one in like a day and a half. Like I got so into it. It tells some really interesting sci-fi stories. Yeah. It does what Star Trek does well, which is although there is a bigger uh, season plot, each episode kind of has its own kind of like twist on a classic Star Trek tale or a cool sci-fi adventure or a cool adventure on the holodeck. And it really kind of turned into a cool sci-fi show. So I highly yeah. recommend it. Okay. There you go. Um, all right, Sam, what else you got for us before we, we get to another break? So that concludes our trailers. But uh, speaking of things that got love, Ooh. Inside Out 2 is having an incredible second weekend. So the predictions had been that it was going to be 85, maybe even more, maybe 95. Now, according to Forbes, its second weekend is going to make $98 million. Now, if that figure holds, this will be the first time since Barbie mm. that a, uh, a film makes more than 90 million in its second weekend. And I think this is the, and it is, it will be the best second weekend for a Disney animated feature ever. Wow. So it sure seems like based off this, Pixar is Pixar is back up and running. So, gentlemen, what do you think? I mean, we've we've all seen Inside <laughs> Out too. We've all enjoyed it. Um, is this uh, is this train just going to keep on going? What do you think, Mikey? It is because it's a great movie. Mm. Um, my fear is that Disney's going to take away the wrong lessons here, and we're just going <laughs> to start getting sequel after sequel after sequel, and be like, oh, they only want stuff they know. They only want stuff they know. And while it is true that I think Inside Out uh, is a beloved movie and people are really excited, the reason that you have a second weekend like this is because everybody came out of the first weekend and said, holy shit, that's a great movie. Like, that's mm -hmm. really what's going on. I've been getting texts from people all week, and they're like, oh, my God, I just saw it. Oh my God, I was bawling my eyes out. Uh, I loved it. It's almost as good as the first one. I think it's better than the first one. Like, it's just, this is, they nailed it. They nailed mm -hmm. a really, really solid story. Uh, and it really hits uh, and on a universal level. And everybody's loving it. And it's a joy to see. And once again, I, somebody, one of our one of uh, our followers said this on Twitter, mm. you know, we're going to get to the Oscars at the end of the year and they're going to announce the best animated features of the year. And they're going to make some fun, funny little comment about how animated movies, maybe if you have kids, you go see these movies and then you get to vote for them and they'll make some joke about animation being kids stuff. <laughs> and at some point you got to be like, um, animation is keeping this entertainment industry afloat. Like mm. animation is be way beyond kids movies at this point and it's one of the few things that when it's done well audiences of all ages will actually go sit in a movie theater to watch it so i think it's going to be really interesting to see how inside out performs for the rest of the summer well yeah, and I mean, also yeah. before the weekend they uh the pete doctor announced that there was going to be an inside out uh disney plus series yeah. as yeah. well uh so johnny what do you think of this incredible success of this sequel i'm so happy i love the sequel i think what it had to say about mental health in the last 30 minutes of that film i think was so powerful and moving and touching i caught myself getting emotional two or three separate times throughout the movie and i went in with my i went in a little bit like okay let's see if they can capture the magic i mean once you get rid of bing bong i really don't want anything to do with you but like i was concerned and then it really knocked it out of the park and gave you more elements that are so universal like riley yes riley is a teenage girl riley is a teenager period and so the things that she experiences i thought the way they nailed the universality like they nailed it in the first movie and this is a different director by the way i thought was so well done man just absolutely well done so i'm very happy to see a film like this doing so well and it clearly speaks the story speaks to people in a universal way or else they wouldn't keep going back to it. And certainly I hope the younger generation is seeing themselves up on screen and having honest conversations about mental health and anxiety and panic attacks and transitioning from one stage in your life to another and how to, uh, how to do that with some court of some kind of grace and understanding between your friends and all that kind of stuff. So to me, it just was a really powerful film. So I'm happy to see it doing well. I don't know what the percentages is. Somebody asked me how much it was going to drop, and I'm like, this is going to be a very, very low drop between the first weekend and second weekend. And now that it's almost possibly going to break the second weekend of an animated film ever, um, it, it makes me even more confident that, that that I was right on that one because it's a film that is just so, so well done.
Yeah. Well, it's a good thing Disney's making all this money because they're going to need it for Blade. So we found <laughs> out throughout sure the uh, they're going to need it for Blade. Yeah. <laughs> throughout the development process, the 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 different versions of this movie that have existed. Uh, there was an article this week. In, da, 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 in the Hollywood Reporter talking about at one point, um, Blade was going to be set in the 1920s. I think that was the most re uh, recent version yeah. with a uh, Yann Demange um, attached that. And, and because of this sort of extended process of filming getting delayed and delayed, you know, they've lost Del Lindo, They've lost uh, Aaron Pierre. Um, apparently the version with uh, Bassam Tariq uh, it was they had already built a, 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 tra a train station set that was going to be used in an elaborate action sequence. So this just kind of, again, goes to show you that when they announced Mahershala Ali as Blade, they weren't entirely sure what this movie was going to be. I mean, generally, when you have a movie that's announced, you know when the time period is going to be. In general. Uh, but Mikey, again, I'll throw this one over to you. What do you think about the extended development process? And will we ever see the Daywalker in the MCU? Uh, yeah, that is a really good question. I think the more uh, the more interesting revelation than the 1920s part, although that is really interesting, is that the movie uh, was supposed to have Blade's daughter in it? Yep. Um, I, you know, like, I think when the buzz came out and they're like, we're, we're pulling back on Blade. It's just about Blade fighting vampires. And we were all like, the fuck does that mean? Of course, Blade's going to fight vampires. <laughs> like what? What? You, uh, Blade's daughter, who, as far as I know, is a more recent creation in the comic books. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, had a daughter. She's one quarter vampire. But the plot of the movie was, oh, Lilith needs her blood for reasons. Lilith, and who is going to be played by Mia Goth. Who yeah. is going to be played? Who's going to be played by Mia Goth? Uh, and um, the wife. And, is, and in, in the Marvel universe, is the daughter of Dracula, not biblical Lilith. But right. that is in the in the Marvel universe, Lilith in the comics, Lilith is the daughter of Dracula. Whether that's going to be what they do in the movies, but I think that starts to get into oh, this is what they were talking about. They had a period piece in the 1920s where Blade had a daughter, and I think that's where you start to get into this complicated thing because for most audiences. When you say Blade, they just think Wesley Snipes mm -hmm. from the early 2000s. And that was pretty straightforward. Like, he was a daywalker. They defined what a daywalker was. He went on an adventure. He had to stop a bunch of vampires. But now, as they're bringing Blade back into the MCU, it was like, oh, well, he was around in the 1920s. Also, he is a black man. So if you're going to do a story that's set in the 1920s or the 1930s, there is a whole host of things that... <laughs> you, have you either have to deal yeah. with or you don't deal with and it's yeah. silly <laughs> and blade has a daughter that he is ostensibly going to have to be protecting which is less about fighting vampires and more about protecting the like you start to get why oh there's a lot of things in this pot and that may be pulling back so it's going to be really interesting to see that if it's no longer in the 1920s uh which could mean, okay, well, now we don't have to deal with some of the issues that maybe we were going to have to deal with then. Mm -hmm. um, if they're going to keep the daughter thing, it, it, that you it just you can see why they're having a hard time here. Because, you know, as we talked about when we talked about Blade, I believe, last week, it was like, you know, what is that hard R, if it's going to be a hard R? Like, how do you do Blade in the MCU and have it be what people want it to be, but still be this four-quadrant film? And now you start to see some of these other pieces and you're like, oh, I see maybe what you were trying to do, but maybe this is why you're having a hard time because it's just not hitting the mark. So the that's the long-winded answer of saying, I don't know if they're ever going to figure this out. Johnny, <laughs> is Blade a nay? <laughs> <laughs> I think it, I, the one thing that came out, and there's a really good write-up on this in The Hollywood Reporter. People should read this if you really want to know all the behind the scenes on this. Um the thing that in the 1920s thing, you know, again, if you can make it work, I don't care about that kind of stuff. Sounds cool and interesting. What would they confront in the 1920s? Fine. Make it work organically in the story. I don't care. Put three women and make it with Blade. If you make it organically work and it's an interesting story, I don't care as long as you're telling me an interesting story and a fun film. But what stood out to me reading this breakdown of this all, other than the fact that Maharshala is quote unquote getting increasingly frustrated about this whole situation is that apparently he exercised, and they, this is what they're claiming, an inordinate amount of influence over the project in a way few other actors have on Marvel movies and envisioned Blade as his Black Panther. 
this is where I think we're having the problem. And now I'm not trying to blame Maharshala Ali. He's got a right to want to elevate what he thinks uh, the project should be. And there is a void how we don't have a Black Panther, even though I know Shuri stepped into the role. But this, I, this, this possibility here of having a black man represent black male superheroes in the Marvel Universe. We've had Sam Wilson, but this is original thing rather than taking over someone else's mantle. And so uh, I, I understand what he was trying to maybe do here. I just don't think this is the arena to do it. And maybe that's the problem here. I mean, you know, him trying to see Blade as a much more elevated thing when Blade is not necessarily that. Now, does that mean it can't be done? Of course not. So it's a map, but clearly they're having trouble breaking the story to make it work for everybody involved. And in the end, people keep leaving. So what, to me, this is where there has to be some give on all sides because this is becoming a PR disaster and a PR nightmare. And you're not going to get high quality directors who are going to want to be part of this and risk their reputation on something that might fall apart at any moment because it's already been falling apart numerous times. So there has to be some kind of compromise that is reached here because at the, right now fans, they just want a damn good Blade movie. They don't care about it being elevated or making a commentary or anything like that. They just want a good Blade movie. And so I think they got to go all the way back to square one and be like, how do we construct a good, fun, exciting Blade movie that still has something to say but isn't overtly trying to be Black Panther I think that's the approach at this point. But uh, but then again, you might lose Maharshal Ali, and maybe it is time to lose Maharshal Ali because he's been hanging on for five years now. Like, maybe it's time to move on, and maybe it's time to thank him for his service and find another young black actor, upcoming actor, who's strong enough to take over the role. I think that could be fun. So Well, as of right now, Blade is still <laughs> scheduled to release in November Shit. of 2025. Yeah. So who knows? Maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll get some announcements at Comic-Con. I doubt it. Uh, one last thing before we go. I know we got to go. I know this has been a long segment, but uh, uh, real quick thoughts. Jeff broke this on the hot mic. Miles Morales, live action. Sony is apparently looking for him. So, are you guys excited by this? <sighs> Do you or, or are you so trepidatious because of what we've seen from Sony? And let's keep this to like 60 seconds each. Uh, Jeff, Mikey, you first. No, <laughs> is that your 60 seconds? Is that it? Okay, uh, listen, I. I think they're looking at the Sony, the animated movies, and they're going like Miles Morales is the thing that's going to fix this for us. Uh, but uh, but I think that Miles Morales is one of my favorite characters in the Marvel in the Marvel universe. Period. Mm. Um, but putting him in the mess that they've made, I don't know that that gets them out of the mess that they made. Or yeah. if they're just going to be like, let's put this whole mess aside and do live action Miles Morales movies, I would still. As, as much of a mess as as Marvel is right now, I'd kind of prefer them to deal with Miles than Sony. I mean, Sony just hasn't won any kind of goodwill for me on the live action side where I think they could do anything. I want Sony to dump the entire live action venture completely and just focus on animated movies that Lord and Miller make and make 39,000 of those and I'd be happy. Yeah, fair point. Uh, Shannon, your thoughts on this? If the inclusion of Miles is in the MCU, Yes, if this is a if this is a natural handing of the baton, passing of the baton from Tom Holland to to this to this young actor, fully on board. But my guess is that's not what it would be. <laughs> is no. that again, as Vogel already put, they're looking for some sort of salvation out of this unholy mess they've created. And uh, I, I think as uh, as cool and important a character as Miles is, this is probably not the way to to find him. Yeah. As Steve Carell, as Michael on The Office once said, no, God, no, no, I don't that, want that Sony. Marry that. Yes, I don't want Sony to do Miles Morales. Don't mess it up. Um, all right, let's take a quick break and uh, we'll jump into some Star Wars stuff. Oh, <laughs> get ready right after this. Do, 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 do. All right, let's get into Star Wars stuff. We'll make it quick here, ladies and gentlemen. So there's obviously the fandom has never been at a fever pitch like it is right now. Some elements of the fandom. Clearly, there are the anti-Disney Star Wars people who are very adamant to hate on the Acolyte, don't like anything about the Acolyte. Some elements of that have gone with legitimate criticism. Some elements have uh, devolved into racist, bigoted, sexist, homophobic comments about the things around Again, not all, but listen with your ears, 
Not all the critics are saying that. Just some. I just want to make it clear. On the other side, there are people who are going so far overboard that they're becoming toxic, positive Star Wars people that any criticism, you're being labeled as a racist, bigot, uh, sexist, homophobic person. Again, some, listen with your ears, some in the positive Star Wars side of things are saying that. Other people in the positive Star Wars side of things are liking it and having legitimate things they love about it and also looking at it like we are kind of in the middle with the things we like, things we don't like, and talking about it honestly. So, But it has sparked quite a lot of comments here throughout this week, and I want to get you guys' thoughts on all of it. Uh, Leslie Headland pushed back as the showrunner of The Acolyte, and uh, she was talk talked about THR, about the clip getting unexpected attention when she was asked in an interview segment about star wars saying if the series was the gayest star wars to date she said i was surprised by the question amanda and i just burst out laughing because that's our knee-jerk reaction to being asked about that to be honest i don't know what the term gay means in that sense i don't believe that i've created with a capital q content i honestly feel sad that people would think that if something were gay that that how somehow would be bad. It makes me feel sad that a bunch of people on the internet would somehow dismantle what I consider to be the most important piece of art that I've ever, ever made. And it, addressing the Brendock witches, she said they're in a matriarchal society. As a gay woman, I knew it would read that their sexuality is queer, but there also aren't any men in their community. So a closeness between the two of them would be natural. It seemed plot-driven. I would say it's really reductive to call them lesbians. I'm proud of being a gay woman who, uh, who's accomplished this feat. And certainly if my content is called queer, I don't want to disown whatever queerness is in the show. And then Dave Filoni was asked about an R-rated Star Wars, and his response was, I mean, I don't know. I think it's interesting. The bottom line is whatever we do, it has to be really well done. I think when you look at something that is taken a different, taken as different uh, like Andor, it's so well done, and Tony and his team do such a phenomenal job that I think there's an audience for that. I think also with that audience, I also though want to still be hitting the imagination of the kids out there so that they can grow up and appreciate those things and on the feloni track uh this is from the culture crave uh, uh twitter feed uh episode four writer claire kekel says dave feloni give no gives notes on all the acolyte scripts quote he has to ultimately approve them along with the rest of the lucas film team so a lot here to process and navigate and what have you so um gentlemen your thoughts on on what you're hearing here and what your thoughts are on the massive uh, uh backlash and support this is uh, star wars has been getting as a result of the acolyte uh in terms of dave filoni and an r-rated star wars personally i don't see the point of an r-rated star wars like what is it that you actually want to see out of it do you want to hear uh an imperial drop an f-bomb do you want to see a jedi disemboweled like um what we have gotten i i think is firmly planted in the pg-13 uh category with uh with andor um, and, and I don't think you need to go further than that. And in, in, in my opinion, I mean, again, like the, the idea that Quentin Tarantino was going to do a Star Trek film, everyone lost their shit over it. And it's just like, oh, great. I can't wait to hear, you know, fucking beam me up, Scotty. Like, <laughs> I, like, but for Star Wars, like, I don't, I don't really see the point of that. Um, to Dave Filoni giving notes on the scripts. I mean, yeah, he's highly placed at Lucasfilm. I mean, prior to his most recent promotion, he was already... He, he was in the uh, upper echelon of their creatives. So the yeah. fact that the one of the screenwriters from uh, potentially the most vitriolically reviewed episode of the series thus far is saying, hey, by the way, we didn't do this alone. And, and I think we spoke about that on the last show is like yeah. it's very easy to point to a director on a television show and like you messed up. Sure, yeah. TV, TV directors typically are hired guns. Well, then it's easy to point at the showrunner, Leslie Hedlund. You messed up. Sure, yeah. But she also reports to people from from Lucasfilm and Disney, and they are the ones that are ultimately giving their stamp of approval to say, "Go and make this." So I, I think it was kind of I think it was good for the uh, screenwriter to try to remind people of that that to to um, paint one person as the as the uh, uh sole uh, uh <laughs> sole recipient of all of this critical rage is probably not fair because mm -hmm. film tv it's a very collaborative collaborative medium mm -hmm. um to the is this the gayest star wars ever i mean look the the witches i didn't see that it's a matriarchal society to yeah. me this was no different than the amazons in in dc uh so if they happen to be romantic they happen to be romantic like i don't like it it, it doesn't it doesn't uh this is not the thing that affects me about this show. I mean, there are there's plenty of stuff to criticize 
from my point, um, uh, legitimately, this is not this is not one of the things to criticize, though. Okay, fair, Michael. Your thoughts on what's going on right now around the acolyte and some of these uh, comments here? I mean, I think overall, my thoughts are: look, the acolyte's not great, mm -hmm. but it's also not horrible. Like, it's it's got a lot of problems, and I think when we do our weekly reviews, we hit on a lot of what we think those problems are. Yeah. It is not the worst thing ever. It's not destroying Star Wars. There's no reason to have a fucking funeral for Star Wars, as some oh. toxic fans are talking about online. Um, oh, so and common. it's also not perfect Star Wars. It's not the best Star Wars show that we've gotten. It's not doing the greatest thing in the world, but... It's got a lot of stuff that's cool about it. It's got a lot of stuff that's really not working about it. Yeah. And that's the honest answer. And what's happening right now, like we haven't seen this kind of ridiculous, uh, extreme reaction since Last Jedi. And the extreme mm, reaction yeah. post Last Jedi got us the rise of Skywalker. And yeah. I'm afraid that that's kind of what's <laughs> going to happen point. again. Like, look, Last Jedi, I out of the three of us, I'm the one that really likes it. Uh, our, my other two buddies do not like it as much. I don't think Last Jedi is perfect. I think it has a lot of issues with it. But I think what happened with Last Jedi is, in the exact same way, a certain section of the fan base went absolutely batshit. And Lucasfilm said, great, Ryan Johnson out. Get JJ back in here. Fix mm. everything. Get these fans back on board. And we got probably, in my opinion, the worst of the nine Star Wars films. Um, because it wasn't really a story as much as it was a weird apology tour yeah. of let's give you guys all the stuff that we really think you want. And then Palpatine returned and Chewbacca got a medal and Lando sort of had a daughter that it sort of looked like he was hitting on. And we got a really weird movie. Um, and I think Lucasfilm right now is kind of dealing with this as well. They're looking at this fan base and you're like, what do you do with this? Because these when I when I go to YouTube and I look at all of these uh, thumbnails for these videos with rainbow flags with X's through them and Star Wars used pronouns, it's horrible now. They made Star Wars so gay. Woke wokeness killed Star Wars. I'm like, guys, that's not the problem with this show. Right. And if what Lucasfilm takes away from this is we're either going to ignore every criticism of Acolyte because it's all toxic, or we're going to give into this and only put white male straight people in the lead just to appease these people. We're not going to get good uh, Star Wars. Hmm. Like, there's stuff that needs to get fixed. This ain't it. Um, yeah, look, I think Leslie Headland coming out, She, I think her comments were really good. I think she walked a tightrope act. How yeah. do you say, I'm a proud queer uh, showrunner, and I'm happy that people are finding queerness in my work. And also, I don't think I overdid it and put a ton of queerness in here. Like, yeah. this isn't some epic lesbian love story. This isn't like, like, it's just not that. I'm just telling a Star Wars story. Um, I think the writer coming out and saying, hey, Dave Filoni gave notes is basically saying, hey, we put Kiati Mundi in here for a reason. And Dave Filoni understands the reason. And he said, okay, too. Stop talking about it. Like, we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. Yeah. Um, and then Dave Filoni's comments about, I'm with Shannon. Like, I think these, these discussions about, we want dark, we want kitty. We want this star Wars has always been kitty. Star Wars has always had darkness. Like it's had both. It will always have both. And I think going to say, what about an R rated star Wars? Like I'm with Shannon. Like, so do we want to see like game of Thrones in Coruscant? Like, I don't know. Is that cool? Could be. But I think that Star Wars is always going to want to have that broad family appeal. Um, and the last thing I would say, because Laura, uh, uh, Johnny's um, co-host on the Jedi Way, retweeted this. And I think this is really true. Uh, somebody said, you know, if only there were some white straight males running things over at Star Wars who could stand up and defend the choices that these people they hired have made and kind of push back on this toxic fan base, that would be great. Oh, wait. <laughs> There are, and I didn't think about it until I read that comment, but I think it's kind of shitty. I think Dave Filoni and uh, Favreau to a degree, and a lot of people are over here on the sidelines watching the fan base go absolutely batshit, and they're not coming out and going, hey, we were all on board. Now, does that mean they really think the Acolyte didn't do great? I mean, they didn't They didn't stand up and say a lot about Book of Boba Fett either. So, hmm. you know, I mean, I... I, I I get it, but like at the same time, it's like at a certain point when a fan base gets a little too rowdy, and I think the Star Wars fan base is a little too rowdy right now, somebody's got to come out and be like, guys, calm the fuck down. Yeah.
I mean, that's that's listen, I, I appreciate Leslie's comments. I think she did what is best. She's in she's a, a Hollywood person. You got to stay alive, you gotta stay, you gotta say the right things in certain moments, but you gotta be honest as well. And she was very honest in, in how she approached it. Good answer, certainly uh, respecting the, the queer fans, her being queer, respecting all of that, but also being clear about, like, you know, this is where I was coming from. This is the vision I had for the show. This is how we're approaching it. Trying to add more nuance to the conversation and how to look at her show, which I thought was great. No surprise to hear Filoni giving notes. No, so I've said this for the last few weeks. From what I hear, and I think Michael kind of echoed it last week, from what I hear, he's been involved in this process. Some people are trying to say, well, he just got the position a few months ago. Get the fuck out of here, man. Okay, Filoni's been involved in this situation with a lot of these shows for a while now. What do you think? He's just sitting until they call him. Hey, Dave, we're thinking of this. What do you think? No, he is very much involved in this kind of stuff. But, Michael, I take your point, and I said this, as, I said this last week. I'm, he is sitting up there with his boots on the desk and not saying a thing while Leslie is taking all these hits. The writers are taking all these hits. This toxic side of the fandom. Not every person who doesn't like the acolyte or has wow. legitimate criticism is toxic. I want to make it clear. Listen with you. I'm not saying that. But the toxic people who are invested in trying to destroy this thing, and I saw many people say, like, if they hate it so much, why do they keep watching? You know why they keep watching, because they have to make money on their channels by complaining about it. It doesn't mean that they might not actually feel this way, but there is also a benefit to them tearing it apart. But this is there's a dishonesty there that I think needs to be addressed in terms of the people who are involved with Star Wars. Come out. You and McGregor had to come out and defend Moses Ingram. Kathleen Kennedy didn't. None of these people, they all need to come out in stronger ways to support the product and the content. And especially if they're involved, especially if they're involved. I don't know how much Fevro was involved in this or whatever, but Filoni right. should be out there saying some stuff and defending it, especially since the writer is saying. Filoni gave notes. If Filoni gave notes, this is also on him. And I saw already some of the toxic side be like, oh, they're trying to, trying to throw Dave under the bus. Get the fuck out of here. Look, this is the thing about it at the end of the day. Everybody is involved. Therefore, everybody shares the blame. If you don't like that current Star Wars, even your saint Dave Filoni shares some of the blame. So come on, be honest and fair with your criticism. Don't be selective. And I think that's a, the thing. And, I, and I'm sad to see the Star Wars fandom devolving into this and what's happening and death threats for the Wikipedia page. I mean, it's so unnecessary because these are fictional characters. It's not a real universe. And it doesn't mean you can't love it. It just means you got to love it, but also understand, like, you don't got to access these really uglier sides of yourself and allow this to take control of you to do things like this and threaten people's lives over their comments or their opinions or their points of views. Like it's about having healthy discourse and we need to find our way back to it because this is going to destroy the, the, the franchise rather than save it or turn it around. And that's just a shame to see all around with what's happening, you know, and we're going to keep reviewing it though. We're going to keep talking about it here on the show for as long as it's well, around. And yeah. also the big thing to remember is star Wars is what 77 and it's like almost 50 years old mm. around what well, star Wars around 50, 40 something, 40 something years old as a brand. Uh, one TV show is not going to do it, guys. Not yeah, going to kill yeah. Star Wars. Yeah. Star Wars hasn't been hasn't died yet. It might go through periods where it goes through really rough patches, just like Star Trek and yeah. some of the other brands that we love have gone through. But one TV show isn't going to kill it. One TV show didn't destroy Star Wars. One yeah. one TV show might not be your favorite might not be top of your list, and it might be the top of somebody else's list, and that's totally fine. If the Ewok TV movies didn't yeah. kill star wars yeah. this isn't gonna do it if the super weird droids cartoon that was on saturday morning didn't kill star wars so this whole killing star wars thing i mean this that's what really i'm like guys come on yeah and yeah and to john's point you know i got in a 20 minute debate with somebody about the pronouns in episode four oh. the one moment with basil oh. the tracker guinea pig um and they were like well it was just bad writing i don't have any issue with the, the the pronouns it was just bad writing but my response to that is like look you want to talk about bad writing acolyte has some bad writing yeah like there are some moments that the writing is not great but if you're focusing on this one thing as the thing you're not actually just arguing the writing you're getting yeah. into this whole wokeness this whole thing and like that's where i'm just like that's not a discussion people of color queer people telling stories in the star wars universe and putting people in the star wars universe that look and act like them that's that's normal yeah that's actually just perfectly fine 
And clearly, it's not damaging because if you guys have uh, the uh, the uh, negative reproach, which I think is what's making them more upset, which is why they're doing funerals for Star Wars and all this, the histrionics of all of that, it is because they're not actually making a dent in the viewership. The Acolyte is number six in top ten shows watched over the last week. And that tells you that they clearly, people outside this bubble, and it's a very small bubble, the main people who are casual Star Wars fans are watching the Acolyte, and the numbers are there. So I think that's also fueling their anger that there's actually now a backlash, and there's actually now numbers to support that they're not actually making a dent in the in the viewership of these Star Wars shows. And so it's just screaming into the void at times or into the bubble. And uh, unfortunately, you know, that's that's just something that Star Wars has to deal with now. But it's great to see that there's a pushback on the more toxic elements, not on the legitimate criticism, right. which I think is fair to have, you know. Um, all right. Well, anything else, Shannon? Uh, anything on your end? Or are we good? No. <laughs> yeah, that's my boy. All right. Let's take a break. And we'll get into the boys uh, right after this. <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> Y'all, I really got I really got to pee. I'm sorry. I'll be yeah, go give pee, me give me pee. give me give me 60 seconds. I'll be right back. Yeah, I know. We, the show's going long. Go pee, go pee. Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, another thing. <laughs> well, let's take Shannon down off the thing cuz I don't want him to be seen on camera. Um anything uh, anything bothering you Mike before we jump into the boys? Anything you want to talk about? Any news item that jumped out at you this week? Anything that you're excited about? Anything you want to announce? Oh, are we putting Shannon going to pee on the show? Is that yeah, part oh, of yeah, the, no, that's part of the show? Editing, are you like, crazy? That role? I'm not editing this. Tell me. Right. Right. Well, I don't Shannon's going to pee, everybody. <laughs> Anything else bothering me? No, I spent most of my week uh, arguing with people about Star Wars on Twitter. Okay, well, was, what are you watching right now? My week. What can you recommend? What am I watching? I way. caught up on my adventures with Superman Season 2, which okay. I think is absolutely delightful. Okay, and what's uh, that on? What's the, where can people catch that? People can patch, catch that on Max. It's, okay. uh, it's on the DC Hub on Max. And look, I think it's great. I think that... Uh, it's one of the they're telling a really interesting kind of new take on the Superman story. Mm -hmm. I know it's not a lot of people's cup of tea because they think it's too anime or too this or too young or whatever. But I actually think uh, it's hitting all the beats that I want a Superman show to hit. I actually caught up on that and was so enjoying like Superman animation that I went back and watched like the first three or four episodes of the Superman adventures from back in the day when we Ooh. were kids. So I okay. kind of had a whole superhero week. I've been diving back into some old classic stuff. I even watched some old Batman, the animated series to get ready for the new Batman animated series is coming out in August. So right, right, right. Uh, it's, it's been a good week as far as new stuff. Um, this week was kind of busy and hectic and I didn't really dive into okay. anything new. I wrapped up uh, the latest season of Abbott elementary yes. and I, uh, checked out a couple other shows, but yeah, nothing, nothing really blowing me away. Honestly, okay. the thing I've been most excited about this week is, you know, like obviously we watched the acolyte when it came yeah. out, uh, the boys, which we're about to talk to and that talk and then, um, the doctor who finale, which Roka mm -hmm. and I will be uh, reviewing later yeah. this weekend. Yeah. We're reviewing it uh, tomorrow. So look for that review tomorrow as we're recording this today, but yeah, definitely. All right, Shannon, you're back. Oh, no, he's still getting on. All right. Well, I'll say this real quick. We've we've gone into mom. I'd never watched mom before. We were looking for something to like have as a fun show to watch when we're done watching the cult documentaries. By the way, the new Jonestown uh, uh, cult documentary on Hulu, fantastic three episodes about that one day where they all drank the Kool-Aid. It is harrowing. Highly recommended. The TikTok dance cult, one that's on Netflix. Absolutely watch that. But we like to you know watch something fun. We're done with Abbott. So we started Mom. We finished off a season in three days. That show is fantastic. I highly, highly recommend. If you haven't seen Mom, it's on Hulu. Absolutely watch it. Janie and Ferris are incredible on that film, the show. So there you go. Um, all right. Let's get into the boys. Uh, let's do this. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. Uh, where are we get? Here we go. The boys. <laughs> the boys. Uh, so season four, episode four drop, ladies and gentlemen. And what an episode it was. Homelander uh, essentially trying to transcend, quote unquote, transcend his humanity. Starlighter, Starlight getting exposed by Firecracker for her stuff from the past. Sister Sage's plan coming into motion. Kamiko dealing with uh, what she had done in her past. Frenchie with his past with Colin gets exposed. This whole episode was about everyone, including Butcher, exploring their past and dealing with the trauma of their past and how they... Um, have brought that into the present and how they're trying to overcome it, including Huey, who came to terms with uh, what he had done in his past and getting that compound B. And then was it him or his mom who gave his dad that compound B? And I've seen rumors now 
that people are starting to speculate that his mom is actually not there, that that's all a creation in Huey's head because no one interacts with his mom. And I'm like, holy shit, is that what's going on here? So there's a lot to discuss. Michael, your overall thoughts here, episode four of The Bullets. Well, it's funny that you say that about Huey's mom. I didn't think that. Mm. Uh, and I was like, oh, shit. Like, I got to the end of the episode. I'm like, Huey's mom, Huey's mom gave him, gave him the compound. Like, that's crazy. Right. Um, but it's interesting you say that because I do think uh, Jeffrey Dean Morgan is only in Butcher's Head. Oh, um, so I never thought that. So I, 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 I call it like my sixth sense test, but I, I, and if I'm right, I passed it in one sense and I failed it on the other. The sixth sense (laughs) test is after sixth sense, you got to be really careful. And if a character is only talking to one other character and nobody else references them or looks at them or sees them, you'd be like, is this real? Is this real? (laughs) Uh, and um, with Butcher, um, oh, what's her face from, uh, for all mankind, his, his, yeah, Becca. his, Becca, Becca. Yeah, yeah. Becca's obvious. We all know Becca's not really there. Yeah, um, and we've seen the moments where he's talking to Becca when other people are there and we see that she's not there. So we understand that she sort of is his conscience who's kind of appealing to the better side of Butcher. But then I all of a sudden realized as I was kind of watching this episode, uh, even though he wasn't really in it, like the Jeffrey Dean Morgan's character, I was like, oh, wait a minute. Did anybody else see that guy? <laughs> no, he just showed up to talk to Butcher, and he's definitely uh, playing the other side of the Butcher card, like the other side of the oh, you're not, you're you should go kill this kid. You should you should drug this kid, and we should use him. And I'm like, oh okay. But so now that you say that about Huey's mom, which I didn't yeah. think about, I'm like, oh shit. Do not take that temporary V. That yeah. is some shit. Um, so that's really interesting. But yeah, overall, I thought this episode was absolutely wild. Like everything with the Homelander stuff was ridiculously intense. Um, the political commentary yeah. coming out fast and strong with everything that Firecracker does to Starlight is wildly uh, entertaining and scary because of its accuracy. Like what the way they are taking the way Sage sort of lays out that we have gotten these memes, we're attacking everybody with memes, we're appealing to this group to like be our anti starlight group, we're going to take her down on social media. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, well, that is that is what we are currently doing every day on Twitter right now. So that is accurate. And then the mystery of whatever the fuck is going on inside of Butcher's body. And then to your point, the way they're taking all of these different storylines for all of the characters, yeah. like everybody as, as wide and varied as this episode was, every single character was dealing with their past. Every single character was dealing with past choices and how those choices have come back to them in modern day. And so on every level, uh, this episode was firing on all cylinders like this this season of the boys might be my favorite right now wow shannon your thoughts on episode four here brother man of wisdom for the ages i mean again super enjoyable the sixth sense test because there is a scene where bruce willis is sitting with tony collette when Haley joel osmond comes in Ooh. it's like well no no he's he's alive but there's no interaction so there is a scene in this episode where the, the doctor they are discussing removing uh uh, uh simon Pegg's uh, feeding tube right so there is a doctor there but now i need to go back and rewatch like she never there- talks to is, her directly is he was, there it, yeah could you could you just, you just remove her and ask her a question and then turns back so maybe the doctor is like whatever with this guy so i don't know but there's no interaction with her and his mom but to the jeffrey dean morgan of it yeah. it's yeah. it's like oh this is the literal angel and devil on his shoulder yeah because they pretty yeah. much only talk about ryan like yeah. uh uh becca brings up uh huey at one point but for the most part, their their conversations are focused on Ryan. So knowing that Butcher does have some sort of neurological issue with a paris, parasite worm going all over his body. Um, yeah, that's that's a really, really interesting idea. Uh, in general, the violence of the boys, um, yeah, I, I react like everyone does, but it's never gotten me truly nauseated until this last episode when yeah. Sister Sage shows the deep how oh. to give her a lobotomy watching him stick a a thing in her eye with a hammer <laughs> that was the only time my wife and i were watching it last night i'm like oh i'm actually feeling nauseated right now <laughs> you can hear that you hear that every time he nails what uh but again 
super super enjoyable <laughs> watching starlight kick the shit out of firecracker was such a blast and watching sister sage getting some enjoyment out of that yeah. i thought was super fun uh, again the the boys is one of those shows right now that from minute one to the end i'm just completely engaged yeah. i don't look at my phone i'm just i i'm glued the whole time and the way that they can talk they can tackle these heavier topics go to those dark places but still be really really funny um yeah eric kripke and his team man they deserve a lot of credit because this is one of the more compelling shows on right now yeah well, this is the darkest episode we've had of the boys i think in in quite some time and seeing homelander do what he did what was great about that was that you could have easily gone into that and go, oh, my God, he's being evil. He's going to torture everybody who hurt him. He's such a bad person. But when you hear his logic and you hear his reasoning for a middle part of the episode, you could also be like, well, I kind of get it because they did torture him. They did kind of take advantage of a weak kid, not physically weak, but maybe mentally. But then when Barbara shows up and Barbara says, we couldn't beat you because there's no fucking kryptonite. So we instilled in you a crippling desire to be loved. That is devastating. And, you know, especially for someone like me who has constantly struggled with self-esteem issues and low self-worth and if people like me or not, like that's a massive part of my life and my existence. So to see that that's something they're making a commentary on, that what's been keeping him from actually going full, either achieving his potential or for a psychopath, whatever his potential is, is this thing that they put psychologically in his mind to mess with him that threw me for such a loop that i was like now i don't know how to feel about this other than of course it's terrible to kill these people and laser people's penises off and what have you and that shot of barbara sitting in that room covered in blood and body parts is devastating to look at and his you know his face going up in that elevator by the way everyone said he should be nominated for an emmy absolutely for this episode 100 percent. it was so devastating to experience that and then the Starlight situation, Michael, you brought up the medical records violation. Aaron Moriarty, I think, gave just as good as Anthony Starr did in terms of acting uh, performances in this episode. Mm -hmm. Her micro emotions as that whole thing is dawning on her, the horrifying reveal of her past and the abortion, which she agonized over, to have it used in this way, manipulated, and in, in essence, um, staining her with this, rather than and, and disrespecting the decision and the journey and the process just for that person to get some kind of benefit from it was devastating. So when she's punching Firecracker, I was enjoying that, but seeing Sister Sage sitting back, and you see that there's a plan here of her to destroy the boys, but what is her plan here through the seven? What is the ultimate goal and so I'm, I'm left with a lot of questions and, and yes, the scraping of the blood. And when you watch it with the, with the headphones on hearing the scraping of the brain with your headphones on, it is a whole nother experience uh, on another level. So yeah, this, this episode was stellar. Man. My, but I just like, and the writing is so amazing. Like Eric Kripke and his team, just, they, they know what they want to do and yeah. they're doing it. So yeah. even like, you know, when firecracker and Sage have their moment where Sage basically gives her the abortion information yeah, and, and she's like, Oh, I thought you were uppity, but you're one of the good ones. One of the good ones. I mean, yeah. that line all by itself, you're just hitting. <laughs> So many levels of what the dialogue that we are currently dealing with on every possible topic, po political and entertainment, yeah. like you just, you get it. And then watching Firecracker get the shit beat out of her and, uh, and Sage being like, what do you think of that bitch? Like who, who's uppity now? You're like, okay. Like it just, it's, it's so good and so powerful. And yeah, like watching the way that Starlight reacts. I mean, look, Starlight's entire, Starlight's fan base all of yeah. those people that are out there on team starlight a lot of them are her fans because she rose up through those christian ranks so coming out with the abortion is yeah. is devastating to her in that way and just the levels of knowing that look the show obviously has a um bent on who it's critiquing but 
even the Starlight fans, it's going to be interesting to see what fan, what happens in the next few weeks because I think it's going to show that although the show absolutely has a POV and uh, is is skewering MAGA and Fox News and everything else, I think it's also going to show that like uh, even the liberal fan base can be swayed pretty easily. Yeah, uh, and yeah. I think that's what's going to happen with Starlight in the next few weeks and just so just seeing how the president, you know, like how she wanted really hard to get this superhero bill passed through Congress and then basically Bye. because of her actions made it toxic. I mean, you're just seeing all of this behind the scenes stuff going on and it's so well done and so fascinating but the reason it works is because we actually really care about these characters i mean yeah we actually genuinely and they're you know i wouldn't say that a train's arc is on the level of like a jamie lannister mm -hmm. because he never did anything that awful but watching a train slowly come around to this other side <laughs> well and i mean be he like, killed the person <laughs> he, did, he, well, he did run through somebody his girlfriend so it's pretty bad absolutely I, absolutely he did <laughs> but a train how do i say this a train's what a train did in the first episode of the boys yeah, yeah, yeah. was done through like drugs and neglect and i don't care and someone's gonna cover this up it's horrible right. it's bad but it wasn't jamie lannister being like hey cute kid boom like they're jamie lannister sh pushing a child out of a window even though he didn't die and survived uh somehow falls on the you're a little bit worse i'm not saying a train was a good guy but <laughs> the ultimate all i'm trying to say is you're doing your best kind of, I, you're do, I, I rarely see michael digging a hole for himself and this is interesting to watch <laughs> all i'm saying is that the arc yeah. that they're taking him on yeah they've done a really nice job of oh, making yeah. me go Agreed. oh i'm kind of rooting for you to get your shit together like, yeah especially that, with the brother in the same way up. that we did yeah. ultimately fall in love with jamie lannister despite his past mm. despite what a train did and seeing huey sort of go like i wasn't gonna forgive you but now like we're good and I, I think they're doing a really nice job with all of that too. And the whole scene with um with A Train and uh Ashley yeah. in Homelander's uh bedroom apartment. and Ho Homelander's oh, apartment. Uh first of all, Ashley's fucking dumb. Homelander can look at your shit and he's gonna know it's you. Like yeah, he's the DNA. He, right. He, he he can tell. Like, don't shit in Homelander's toilet. Um but yeah, so I, everything with A Train has been really interesting and nice for me too. I've enjoyed yeah. it a lot. Yeah, Shannon. Uh, I mean, really loved the these these uh, sequence with uh, Kimiko and Huey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as they get pinned down by those shining light people, and Huey, you know, he he's he's hobbled already. He's not an effectual fighter to begin <laughs> with. But watching Kimiko as she texts, where it says, "You want your dad to live? You fight or you die." Mm. Like ah, Kimiko, without you, without dialogue, she's so freaking good yeah. and she's so enjoyable to watch i mean again what they have done and, and having not read the comics but but you know you guys that have and mm. have said that the boys show has transcended the comics like oh, they for sure they have plussed it to the upteeth degree i mean it all the characters are just so enjoyable enjoyable to watch and homelander i mean it's like hans it's like hans landa this extended mm. um Pl playing with his food essentially just yeah. like oh i'm gonna talk to you i'm gonna talk to you i'm gonna lay this whole thing out and even the new people like he talks about ah, there's some new faces some old ones as well even the people that were new there that had nothing to do yeah. with his creation everybody's guilty except for the one lady well i think this is the line that he finally crossed that everyone was afraid he was going to cross and if this is his approach of transcending humanity then I think this is going to lead to Ryan confronting him. No one else can take him down in terms of physical power other than his son. And so this is going to lead to a very interesting moment, hopefully in the finale or maybe the end of season five. But there is going to be a massive confrontation, kind of like Invis Invincible, right? With his dad versus Omega, yeah. uh, Invincible versus Omega Man. I think that's coming in this show at some point. But yeah, I mean, just seeing how that all played out was devastating and then frenchy with the collins situation which i will say that's a little bit of a criticism i had in the show because it's too quick the turnaround that should have been a more devastating drawn out kind of back and forth and then colin reacts in such a brutal manner to almost kill him and then realizes what he's done and and, and then walks out you know and kind of like i don't more, know man i don't I, know how much longer you can draw that out like frenchy Frenchie was clearly mm. tore up about it. And the moment that Colin finds out, you're like, that is the correct reaction. That is no, how you I would react. I just think Frenchie should have struggled to say it just a little bit longer. But again, it's a nitpick, man. It's a nitpick. 
he should have struggled a little bit. But, but the reaction from Colin was incredible. And of course, Colin and oh, I forget the uh, the uh, character's name who's working with Starlight as well, who got injured in the in the yeah. like their reaction when they find out that Starlight to go back to what you said, Michael blinded that woman when she was 13 years old they're they don't even offer consolation to starlight they like have the body of like the yeah. body language of like they're ashamed that they're associated with her for a little for when the story pops up so that's gonna play how's that gonna play as this goes forward i remember there's that lawyer there who was watching firecracker stuff uh three episodes ago in starlight's foundation so there might be cracks here well, and the starlight to side of things and i think on the firecracker front i mean i love mm. the boys oh, yeah. has gone the boys has gone back to the well a few times of the well we are going to blackmail these superheroes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we have this we have the goods on you we have the photo of this we have the person that you did this to and so for them to go to firecracker and be like hey you know you're calling you calling starlight a pedophile but this is what you did and we're going to send it unless you stop and she's like cool send yeah and walks right out there because we are and this is true i mean this is this is the part of the the boys that's so fascinating to watch because you watch the boys and it's this superhero universe, but then you turn over to CNN or yeah. Fox News or MSNBC, and we're currently living in a world where whether you're a liberal, whether whether you're an extreme liberal or an extreme conservative, it really doesn't matter what anybody says. You're on your team. You've yeah. chosen your team, yeah. and you're not gonna. So Firecracker comes out and goes, "This happened, but this is what turned me to Christianity, and I found Jesus, and now I'm survived and saved." And it's like she took the wind right out of that threat mm -hmm. because she knows that her followers aren't going to give a shit. Yeah. And the sad part is that's pretty much where we are right now in our political discourse. So I thought that was super powerful. And I think like that's, I think where the boys really succeeds is when they make these choices and do these things, you're watching it and you're like, that is a big swing for a character to assume that everyone's going to be okay or do yeah. this or do this. But you're like, but that's what's currently happening in real life. So it feels real feels yeah. real to me and i think that the boys as as super powered over the top as it is it's grounded in some really realistic shit that is the real frightening part of it like homelander is superman level powers and can do horrible things and we saw him do horrible things in this episode but what makes homelander particularly scary is the way that he is winning people over the way yes. that he can use his heat vision and blow somebody's head up in public with everybody in full view of everybody and nobody cares yeah. is a little too real yeah yeah i don't disagree with you there um all right anything more to say on this episode shall we wrap up this review anything more what do you think uh oh. happened with butcher and uh you know reed richards preacher man oh oh i think he's that like he said he took more of that compound b and so that that little thing that's spinning around in his spine and in his head, that is something that's coming out. That's like what we saw with um, uh, uh, Victoria Newman's daughter, right? Those little things coming out. It is uh, some version of that that he is becoming and blacking out, right? And so he's blacking out and killing. That's dangerous. And so you've added now another element to butcher that although he's already a combustible X factor in every situation that he's in, I loved him and starlight going at it at the beginning of the episode. Uh, now adding this element makes him almost every bit as dangerous as, uh, as Homelander for his side of things. And that will be fast because he tore that preacher up. Like there was just skin and blood on the ground, man. It's that's scary. And the fact that he blacks out, that's even scarier. You know, what do you think? Shane? Uh, I mean, it's definitely that that thing <laughs> that's in him. Yeah. Like that, that's definitely it. What I'm curious, if I can ask one question, because yeah. I know we're trying to wrap up, do we think that this uh, final battle is going to be between Sister Sage and Ambrosius the Octopus? <laughs> for, for the soul of the deep? Is that what you're trying to say? By the way, that would be hilarious. I do want to point out. Uh, he just pours uh, compound B in the tank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On the uh, animated stuff oh, yeah. that the boys has done, which isn't all directly canon, I don't think, but there was an episode where a woman who had cancer, her husband did give her compound Ooh. V and her cancer basically became sentient and eventually like broke out of her body. Oh my so God. So the fact that Butcher has can taking the temporary V oh my God. gave him a tumor and then he admits to Huey when he finds out that Huey's going to give his dad compound yeah. V that he gave himself compound V to try and cure himself. Mm. I think that thing is his tumor. 
I think his tumor is rolling around inside his body and his tumor, like, I don't know if we're going to fully get a, the boys take on kind of a symbiote, except the symbiote is your tumor, but it does seem like there is sort of a, my tumor has been brought to life and taking this compound V has given me potentially like a venom type situation going on. So I think it's going to be interesting. Like the, um, cause his power set in last season when he was taking the temporary mm. V was basically the Homelander power set. He yeah. didn't fly, but he had, he had heat vision. Yeah. He was super strong and he was kind of invulnerable, yeah. but this whole tumor thing is clearly a whole other level. So I think that's going to be a really interesting thing to watch, but like, I kind of think we're going down a tumor symbiote ish road. It's not a tumor, but it could be venom versus carnage. Cause it could be the two father figures in Huey's life, butcher and his dad, becoming these versions of symbiotes and fighting each other uh, at some point down the road. So yeah, well, very, very possible. Hadn't even and thought the other of piece to keep idea. in mind is um, cause this was introduced in uh, Gen V, but uh, the, the uh, virus, the superhero yeah. virus that right. uh, butcher knows about. Yes. So there's a, there's a lot of pieces in play here, which he knows is not strong enough yet to take down Homelander, which he said a couple episodes ago, but yep. they're getting there. So yeah, yep. it'd be interesting. Um, all right, well, there you go. That's our spoiler Ooh. review for The Boys, Season 4, Episode 4. And, of course, our, our entire episode of Geek Buddies. Thank you all so much for watching or listening to us. Shannon, what do we have to tell? Yeah, I'd like to follow us on social media on Twitter. It's at geek underscore buddies on Instagram at the underscore geek underscore buddies. If you'd like to follow me on social media on Twitter, it's at Shannon underscore McClung on Instagram at Shannon the Geek Buddy. If you'd like to follow Mr. Vogel, it is at MK Tune. If you'd like to follow Mr. Roca, it is at The Roca Says. Mike? And we would also love it if you smash that like button below. Subscribe to Johnny's Outlaw Nation page. Check out all the amazing content he's got there. Leave your comments below. I think we covered almost everything this week. Uh, DC, Marvel, Star Wars, The Boys. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we got most, we hit most of it. Uh, let us know what you thought about everything in the comments below. If you're listening to us on a podcast, leave us some stars and comments so we go up in the rankings. And as always, the best thing you can do is retweet this video, post it on your social, send it to your friends and tell them to hang out with your buddies, the geek buddies. Yeah. I can't stress enough. Please subscribe to the podcast. We got to get those numbers up. Those of you who watch us here on the YouTube, subscribe to us on the podcast feed. It's very important and patronize the sponsors of the show. If you Please use those codes that we uh, uh, talk about in those commercials. It's really important so we can keep getting more and more sponsors to come support us and we grow more and more as a uh, as a show uh, and as a podcast as well. We'd love for you all to do that for us. All right. Thank you all so much for joining us. Take care. He says, have a great rest of your weekend. As Michael said, uh, look for our Doctor Who review soon. And of course, House of the Dragon episode two for season two is coming up from us as well here from the Geek Buddies. <gasps> 